so Mitt Romney didn't give a crap about the poor. Uh, he says that the very poor he wasn't concerned about. So that's where I left off in this uh, Chomsky book. Chomsky Occupy. So, so he says, how did we get in the United States? How did we in the United States get to this point? It's not third world misery, says Chomsky, but it's not what it ought to be in a rich society, the richest in the world, in fact, with plenty of wealth around, which people can see, not just not in their pockets. And Chomsky credits Occupy for helping to bring these issues to the fore. You could say that it's now almost a standard framework of discussion. Even the terminology is accepted, and that's a big shift. Driving the shifter occupies relentless and increasingly creative actions in hundreds of cities, including occupying foreclosed homes and disrupting auctions where people's stolen homes are sold off to the highest bidder, which is a good idea. Uh, getting to the auctions where they're selling these foreclosed, uh, foreclosed houses from these folks, uh, from these good-natured folks who don't have uh, anybody standing up for them and defending their rights. Four people. Yeah, yeah. You saw what happened with the Occupy arrest. There's five arrests here in Louisville. And um, while I think they didn't make a mistake, they didn't realize that one of them had made a mistake. They had grabbed for the cop's gun. And then the, the cops, of course, are going to be um, uh, extraordinarily reactive. That's, that's what they always do. Cops are just, they like to react to stuff. Uh, and so when you go violent, that's, ex uh, that's exactly when a police officer knows he's allowed to do something to you. So um, they messed up with that, and you can kind of tell that it was a, a, a click. Hey, they pointed to the cop when he got mad, and they was like, oh, you got mad. We tried to take your gun, and you got mad about it. So we win. <laughs> we win. But um, the, the bigger point is that, of course, you know, it shows the imagery that poor working class people who protest the banks for the foreclosed uh, debacle for the 2008 recession. So for the 2008 recession, um, the, the banks are responsible for it, but American people went ahead and, and just gave uh, all the banks a ton of money. You know, they just, here's a bunch of money, banks, thanks for screwing us all over. So... That's, uh, that happened at Occupy. Uh, of course, they're going to arrest working class people and not the banks. They won't take in any of the people, the corporate managers and the banks out in handcuffs. They won't put any of those folks who are actually screwing people and throwing them out in the streets behind bars. They won't throw war criminals behind bars. And in fact, if you are uh, part of the upper echelon or the aristocracy or the 1%, uh, then you, you, uh, you don't seem to get in trouble for anything. So... Carrying on. So America's not third world misery, uh, but uh, it is in a rich society, the richest in the world. We are the richest society in the world. Plenty of wealth, and we can see it. And it's not just in the pockets, but we can see wealth everywhere. So being in the wealthiest country in the world, we should have better conditions than what we see right now. So Chomsky credits Occupy for bringing many of these economic inequality issues to light. And um, he also, the, uh, you could say that it's a standard framework of discussion, so the terminology is accepted, and that's a big shift. So Chomsky points out that how we've been talking about uh, American politics with the class war being at front and center, economic inequality, there's been a class war for the last 30 years, and this is the first public response to that class war. Occupy has been. <laughs> So Occupy has been in response to 30 class, years of class war here in America. Driving the shift or Occupy's relentless and increasingly creative actions in hundreds of cities, which I had mentioned before, but it's worth mentioning again. It includes occupied foreclosed homes and disrupting at auctions where people's stolen homes are sold off to the highest bidder. These actions not only expose the heartlessness and inhumanity of the system, they offer meaningful solidarity to those being crushed by it. Chomsky speaks to the many options and opportunities that exist to change the system. Uh, and he points to examples in which the movement's vision has already impacted city council proposals, debates, and resolutions, such as the case of New York City Council Resolution 1172. So New York City Council Resolution 1172, 
which formally opposes corporate personhood and calls for an amendment to the U.S. Constitution to permanently ban corporate personhood. So the city council in New York was able to get a resolution passed in order to uh, ban corporate personhood. Right. So the resolution creates clear dividing lines be between the rights of corporations and the rights of citizens, and it adds to the momentum produced by a growing list of cities, including Los Angeles, Oakland, Albany, and Boulder, that have passed similar resolutions. Did you know that Boulder, Colorado, uh, student city council, or uh, the student council for Boulder, Colorado University has like a, a budget of millions, like, I want to say like 15 million or something crazy, uh, crazy high number like that. So whatever Boulder, Colorado University is doing is what all universities should be doing. The students should get themselves some power. If they had a good leader, if they had a good president, if they had a good student body president, which typically they don't. Usually uh, it's college, so you get a bunch of these rich kids, uh, rich kid manipulators who just want to uh, manipulate their way to the position and do as they please and then say ha-ha to all the rest of everybody who didn't get what they want when they leave. Uh, which only shows that, that maybe it's human nature, but it also shows that our youth, our intellectual youth, are uh, learning how to be the paymasters and the owners and the manipulators and dominators and the oppressors. We're not learning how to get along. We're not learning democracy. There's no solidarity anywhere. Uh, so it doesn't give me much hope for the future of Louisville when you have you see the student council at U of L uh, just be a bunch of whiny, pissy, uppity pants, uh, rich white kids who probably never seen struggle a day in their life just trying to fuck other people over. I already knew y'all were corrupt. I already knew it before I even walked in. <laughs> So, so you all just kind of verified. That was the only education I really got. Uh, you all verified. Yep, you guys are just as shitty and corrupt as those that you're trying to emulate. So you'll, you'll be uh, oppressors. You'll probably be more oppressive than the oppressors actually are. Underline Occupy success has been a major focus on the daily details of organizing. Major protests, civil disobedience, and arrest are key parts of movement strategy, but the day-to-day -day activities of discussion, working groups, and general assemblies are the deep structure. The ongoing forces added mass and momentum to Occupy's wave. The locales number in the hundreds, perhaps thousands. Um, I, know, I was just thinking about the... Uh, uh, arrest here in Louisville and you can find out all the arrest at occupyarrest.com and I remember there was uh there was five arrests at Occupy Louisville there's been at least 7,379 arrests in 117 different cities starting July 21st uh, this is OccupyArrest.com. A running total of the number of Occupy protesters arrested around the U.S. since Occupy Wall Street began on September 17th, 2011. So September 17th, 2011. The timeline for the revolution uh, is being documented. So it's, uh, we're not on the main page. Let's see other uh, Occupy Arrest. Maybe I can do a quick find for Lulu. Yeah, okay, 225, so on February 25th, um, it was caught on camera, Occupy Louisville protest turns violent, five pre people were arrested, then they give a link to the Wave3.com story, and of course Wave3.com has got, man, I hope it's, no, it wasn't the same guy, this is Sarah Essenminger and Matt McClutchion. So, there's five, uh, I guess, martyrs for the cause um, here in Louisville. So, that's, that's listed. So, your uh, contributions, America, are being watched. People are paying attention to what's going on. And uh, if you're affiliated with the movement, if you're a protest organization, you got a banner and you're saying you're for Occupy, you'll get on this list. And you'll be one of the people that were part of the sit-in protest when civil rights was going on. You were part of the marches and the demonstrations when the anti-war activism of the 1960s was going on. We're in a brave new world. This is the 60s, um, but all across the world. So 
Well, I guess we're different Americans today, um, so we're going to do it different. It's not going to be about hippie power or freak power, or maybe it should be about freak power since hippie power failed. Hunter S. Thompson did point out how the 60s had failed, but they didn't totally fail because the 60s activists are now embedded in the institutions, and that will help activists here in the 2012 by having those, those folks who are actually embedded in the system. Um, I, I'd like to say Leo Weekly is pretty progressive. I'm very uh, uh, impressed with Leo Weekly's and the Courier Journal's coverage of Occupy. Uh, they, <coughs> they're uh, sensational, so a lot of times they just try to point out the bad things. But just because they point out the bad things, I don't know. I feel like they cover us, whereas like someone like Jake Payne, Jake Payne didn't cover us. Jay Payne predicted us that we'll fail. Oh, they're going to fail. Who gives a crap? But by the way, here's some evidence of some bullshit I found. So, fuck you. You know, I, well, you're going to fucking give up on us before you fucking know about us or hear about us or see what we do? You're just going to give up? That's not that's not right. That's not good reporting. And it makes me think about how Jake Payne treated Gatewood Galbraith. Gatewood Galbraith, freedom fighter, Huey Long of Kentucky. He was the first... I guess one of the major New Dealers, one of the, I guess one of the, oh, the only New Dealer uh, 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 candidate for governor I've ever seen in Kentucky. I've never seen any, very few progressives here in this state. I don't want to say any, but the amount of progressives are in short supply. So Gatewood Gabbard was for everything that Jake Payne supposedly is against. He's for gay marriage, he was against poverty, he's against, you know, the craziness uh, that Kentucky has. Um, but he doesn't actually support people who are supportive of his policies. Um, so he's he's a you know he's just a corporate whore. He's a corporate media whore. He's just taking uh, money from corporate dollars and he's complaining about the world and the politics and he's saying it's a unique and savvy perspective on Kentucky. And while it's a breath of fresh air, it's it's irresponsible. He's uh, he doesn't care about actually solving any of the issues that he is pointing out. In fact, I would make the argument that it is in his self-interest that these problems continue. So his industry, his uh, protest industry, will carry on into infinity. He'll always be a protester, and that's fine. Uh, but it sucks when one protester don't wreck another protester, and they uh, get jealous of others. Kind of like the treatment of Curtis Morrison, um, the only visible member of Occupy who ran for office. Uh, he got 20% or so of the vote, so he, he put a dent into it, but he also, more importantly, had a bullhorn, and he was yelling loudly at the establishment the whole time. And the, uh, Curtis, uh, uh, Curtis Morrison, who's a progressive candidate and has um, all the right uh, policy ideas, he's, he's definitely down with the cause and he definitely cares. Uh, about the, the right issues, and instead we got some corporate paymasters, some absolute crooks in office. So, you know, whether you like them or not, do you really know who the establishment actually is? So go ahead and hate Curt Curtis Morrison, but look at your establishment. There's way more uh, shittier people than, than Curtis. They, in fact, they're, I'd say 99% of those uh, officials in government are shitty people. So... So it's, it's bullshit that Jake Payne would ostracize Curtis Morrison. It's bullshit that Jake Payne would ostracize Gatewood Galbraith. And Gatewood's dead now, so, you know, I guess uh, he can make all his Gatewood jokes that he wants to make. Uh, Jake, Payne, Jake Payne can, but really, uh, Jake Payne should, if he wants to be a good alternative, if he wants to be, instead of just a gatekeeper in which to keep the progressives down, he should be empowering us, and he should be in allowing free information and uh, allowing... Um, uh, you know, the, the, his forum, it's his forum, I'll, I'll grant him that, and I'll give him that intellectual property, uh, but if he actually wants the media to be uh, informative to the public, then he needs to be open uh, from more perspectives, he's a closed-minded asshole, he's a closed-minded uh, uh, bigot, anti-working class, uh, uh, pro-war, uh, pro-abortion, uh, uh, or, or anti-abortion, he's, uh, all the issues that he purports to be against, he's actually the exact opposite, he's a corporate whore, he just wants his dollar, he wants to make his money, so that's, that's Jake Payne, and Jake Payne's coverage of Occupy Louisville has been absolutely, uh, embarrassing, it's been shitty, so for him to even consider himself a news person, um, or a progressive news person, he, uh, um, he shouldn't be considering himself that. He's fucking, he's garbage.
Fuck Jake Payne. <laughs>